Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 616. That's 616 of the Agostino Zynga show. I hope you are doing well wherever this finds you. I am your host, Agostino Zynga. How am I? Pretty well, all things considered. I'm nice and showered and stuff, so I'm ready to go. You know how it is. Teeth are brushed cool i haven't got my turkish chompers in just yet but just you wait i'm gonna come back on this pod one day with no announcement no heads up on nothing and a brand new set of chompers johnny bravo style like two massive big chunky rows like you know those brazilian players actually like doing it a lot especially the black brazilian players they love to get really aggressive massive ones like the ones that are even bigger than their actual teeth they always had in their mouth beforehand I'm not be too sure why maybe long teeth or big teeth is a sign of prosperity in some other countries but regardless i'm gonna get my hollywood smile and i'm not gonna say a single word about it and if anyone comments about it i'm gonna delete and block you (laughs) but yeah apart from that i'm doing pretty good all things considered it's been a pretty hectic week for me i think all things considered um you know this is the last kind of proper week i had prior of sober october so i was trying to make the best of it worked out every single day which was absolutely amazing i was fairly you know well behaved in terms of the food i had a bit of a cheat meal on the saturday in terms of you know sampling the new mcdonald's menu and having that new chicken burger they got on there which was pretty decent but probably not worth the cheat meal probably that's what happens usually when you have a cheat day or a cheat meal sorry when you're working out because you're doing it so often so often but you're doing it once a week you tend to not want to do it all day it changes anyway when you first start doing diets or when you start working out start taking your health seriously usually the cheat meal is like a day you want to go pig out and just eat everything that you've been depriving yourself of from the majority of the week but then the more you start to work out the more you start to commit yourself to it you realize you start to feel super sluggish the next day because you're not used to eating that kind of food because you've been abstaining from it from so long and also you don't you want to see what it's like if you went two weeks without eating that crap then you might say three then you might say four and then suddenly you're in it and you're not really eating it for the most part or if you do want to kind of give yourself a bit of a break you tend to do what the professionals do where they have a cheap meal like one thing in a diet that they usually don't have whether it's cheese whether it's a certain sauce whether it's fries or carbs whatever it is you do that and then you go crazy and then you go back on your wagon beforehand because if you go too nuts it usually can get a bit crazy and i like to always stop normal time i'm going to stop like i don't like to because some people like to do the cheat day all the way until 12 but I like to just do it and the, the same time I'll stop in terms of fasting, I'll just stop around then and then keep it moving. So I still have only got like a four to six hour window to eat whatever crap I want because I'm usually doing some sort of like intermittent fasting thing. So it's been pretty, um, it's, just, it's been pretty, it's been, it's been pretty solid, but no, it's been pretty hectic, I'd say. Not solid, solid is the wrong word. It's been pretty hectic, but I've been actually appreciating it more. I've got to be honest. And of course, as per usual, the one thing that I've kind of taken away from this over October, as much as I'm looking forward to doing my first, you know, what, what and woot woot, it's still amazing to realize the amount of time we waste. Forget all the other things, because for the most part, I think I'm pretty good at like not wasting time watching too much content, not wasting time reading too much content, not wasting time doing all that kind of stuff. If when I'm not working, I'm usually kind of, you know, on the ball in terms of doing my own thing. But even I, who I'm, who I'm quite time conscious, I don't really have many friends, you know, like in real life. So I tend to kind of keep myself to myself. So it's easy for me to kind of avoid that temptation of kind of, you know, um, going to places that I shouldn't be and then kind of wasting time, whatever it may be. So I kind of got most control of my time that I think that most people do. And even I struggle to use my time wisely. But one thing I've realized with Sober October is the amount of time you waste. I, we all do myself included especially for me because i go absolutely crazy when i go out it's not like a minor kind of a couple of drinks thing it's always like you know all the way flipping pedal to the metal you know gear flipping 25 if there is a gear 25 in a car um i'm pushing it all the way to the edge and usually it can end in tears <laughs> you know what i mean and it has before but i've also have the ability to kind of turn it off and when i turn it off i realize quite soon because I've got this tendency to kind of want to fill gaps. Maybe it's an ADD thing, I'm not too sure. So 
when I when I kind of stop doing that one thing in terms of going out and getting crazy, I want to fill it with other stuff. So I start going crazy in the gym. I start working out crazy. I start loading crazy. I start writing. I mean, start doing all the other things to fill in that space of stuff that I'm not doing in terms of that. So it's kind of a, not the best thing overall. But I've realized my output this month has been absolutely insane compared to other months. So I've done so much more in these last 31 days than I've ever done beforehand. And it's pretty cool, but also incredibly embarrassing. And I always kind of equate it similar to when you're in school and you have like one of those mock exams. I know I had one that really kind of shook me up because I was always pretty decent at school. I was always the kind of guy who would, um, weirdly enough, always, 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 always um, do pretty well in exams without really revising. Um, I was always in really decent higher up sets in my year. Um, I had the ability to be pretty decent at sports, which also allowed me to kind of, you know, get friendly with the kind of, with what you'd call them, with people from my ends in terms of the hood, quote unquote people. But then I also had the ability to be smart. So it also allowed me the opportunity to go into the smart sets. But then the... the the more you're in school from like maybe primary school to secondary school, maybe the higher years of secondary school, you can't get away with it anymore. I maybe you could get away with it in year seven. By the time year nine came around, you had to start revising. You had to start actually paying attention in class in order to kind of um, do well in the exams. And I thought I could just coast along with all my smarts I've developed over the flipping last two years. And we did a mock exam to basically give you an idea of what um, level exam you should be taking. I think that's usually the main premise of it. And just to kind of give you an idea on what to expect in an exam. And I took it and I remember getting like all E's or something. I think all E's, something along those kind of lines. But I was already, I knew I was going to do badly because in the exam, I remember sitting there thinking, I don't know anything on this sheet. Like, you know, those kind of, that's nervous sweat. And some of it was, was like um, multi-choice. Some of it you had to write. I was just making up stuff just to kind of, you know, fill in time. But I knew straight away I wasn't going to do well. But when I got the exam results, I was like, wow, I knew I wasn't going to do well, but I didn't know I was going to get E's across the board, D's across the board. And it was a real wake-up call for me because I always considered myself to be pretty smart. And, you know, it was a really good humbling. And it kind of told me I had to take, kind of take life seriously and not muck about too much. So then what I did for the next, what, couple of months or so before the actual real exam, even though some, because my grades are so low in some in some places, I couldn't actually go and do the exam for the higher sets. I could only do like, because I think when you do the exams, they're like be, beginner, intermediate and advanced. I think that's how it is. So your grade is only capped at whatever level you're entered in. So even though I was in those higher sets, because I did so poorly in the mock exams, I still had to go and do like, beginner or like medium ones i remember but some of them they let me do the higher ones but some of them because my mocks were so bad i had to stay so it kind of was a bit of a sap on the wrist in that regard but what i did do is that i remember using the next two months or so and i think this is when it was or if also i remember i think this might have been the time that we first got broadband at home or something so i was properly distracted i was like knee deep in, dis in distractions i was watching tons of movies i was on forums also every single day i wasn't paying attention in school i was out all the time so just being a dumb dumb and then what i decided to do was um focus the next two weeks or so on only 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 focus the next two weeks on revising and i kind of built up a plan i think it was during the summer holidays or something i forgot we had some sort of break i made like a timetable because i knew you know i was very easily distracted so i need to have a strict regimen i'm kind of like that now i have a strict regimen for certain things but then i can go loose on other things but i need to get done the my kind of bread and butter before i go loose so i did this little timetable and i kind of copied what i do in kind of a regular week so i had it specked out monday to friday and then i basically would have whatever lesson i'll be taking on those days i'll just do an hour of revision it didn't mean I'd, I'd kind of be like writing shit, but I could just be reading over my notes. I could be, you know, uh, reading some sheets maybe the, the teacher gave us, doing some mock little tests and whatnot. Just something in that hour every single day, consistently without fail. And then I'd always finish when school finished. So if it was three, four, five, I forgot which, what time it was. And then when it came to the exam, boy, I absolutely smashed it. I got basically the highest level or the highest grade I could get in each subject. So whether it was an A, I got an A, if it was a B, it was a B, it was a C, it was a C. But I absolutely smashed every single one of them. And it really made life easy when times I went to college, by the time I went to uni, I already had like a good base already. So that really worked out better for me. But it was a really stern realisation that, oh my God, look how well I did just by committing to two months of revising. Imagine I spent, imagine if I spent the entire time in school actually focused, you know what I mean? And not kind of mucking around and shit. Imagine where I could have been absolutely madness so 
that's what I've kind of realized during sober October is the time we waste, man, doing things that we probably shouldn't be doing and it's not getting us any closer to where we want to be. It's okay if you just want to, you know, live a regular life, have a kid, have a partner, go on a couple of holidays a year. I think you can get by doing that with just turning up and doing the bare minimum. There's many people out there doing it. So not everybody has to kind of strive to be the best that they can be. I hate all that stuff, right? Because I think Joe Rogan is the one that promotes that kind of thing. And even though I'm a big fan of his, I hate this idea that he has that everybody has an entrepreneur inside of them. You too can go out there and make a business selling wooden furniture or making handmade knives and stuff. It's like, no, some of us just want to be able to pick up a paycheck, look after our family, drive a nice car, go on a couple of holidays a year, you know, uh, sell, you know, flipping, throw a, a really lavish party for our kids that we can never do for ourselves, those kind of things. And I think if you want to do that, you can basically do it by just showing up most of the time, right? Just the, the, the fact that you show up consistently will be might, will be fat, will be good enough and you'll probably have pleasure to hang out with. But if you want to do more, especially outside of regular working hours or you want to do, you want to live an unconventional lifestyle, a lifestyle that most people would love to have, but it's hard to attain and everyone may be trying to achieve it. You need to do the flipping unmanageable and kind of commit all your outside time to that thing which again is pretty brutal because if I did have friends, they'd probably hate me because I'm never out. Unless I'm out for myself, I'm never available to go places because I always feel like I'm wasting my time. I should be recording, I should be writing, I should be making a mix. All these kind of things are popping through my head, which is obviously the wrong way to go about it if you have an actual friend because you want to be present in your relationship and stuff. But hey, we are how we are, innit? We are how we are. So moving on to the show, I went to quickly talk about this and actually give my thoughts and um, send my thoughts and prayers to anybody connected to it who was affected by it and I'm sure most of you are aware the absolute tragedy that happened in South Korea um, just the other day absolutely horrific this is courtesy of CNBC it's a South Korea mourns uh, wants answers after Halloween crush kills 153 people I think last time I checked it was at 149 so I'm guessing a lot of the people that were in hospital um, you know in really in a really bad way unfortunately didn't survive crazy Let's continue here. It says shocked family members collected bodies um, and parents searched for children and a country saw answers on Sunday after at least 153 people were crushed to death when a crowd in a South Korean surged in an alleyway during a Halloween festivities. President Yoon Suk Yul declared a period of national mourning and designated Seoul's popular Itaewon, how you pronounce that? Itaewon district as a disaster zone after the Sunday night disaster. This news comes like a bolt from the blue sky, said a father who burst into tears as he collected his daughter's body from the morgue in the national capital, Platy Hill. A huge crowd celebrating in Itaewon surged um, into an alley, killing at least 153 people, most of them in their early 20s, emergency officials said, adding the death toll could rise. The party is still, the party is, sorry, some still in their 20s um, and their teens, sorry, many in Hollywood costumes were ready to enjoy the bars, nightclubs and restaurants where the revelry routinely spills into the narrow and often steep side streets. Instead, the street became filled with people crying for help with emergency workers desperately sought to free trapped bodies and perform CPR on people splayed across the debris littered grounds. And that essentially was where they all crushed, where we all crushed to death. If you're not watching this, it's basically a really narrow alleyway that's kind of steep, but not crazy steep. It's an alleyway you'd find in any other kind of, you know, metropolitan city. There's always kind of one of these little spots that you basically find maybe in some Mediterranean countries also and the really sad thing about it is that something I wouldn't recommend you doing is if you watch the actual videos um, from the actual crush itself it looks pretty tame especially in the beginning it kind of reminds me slightly of what happened at the at the Astro World Festival where essentially it kind of looked like nothing but if you zoomed in closer and started to look at the faces, you could actually spot some of the people who eventually, who actually passed away in there. You actually see that kind of glazed look over their face. And I think I've watched too many videos of people passing away in those kind of circumstances, especially over during COVID, especially with some of the rappers and stuff. You get to kind of see what it kind of looks like when somebody, you know, his life is being essentially drained from their face it's absolutely tragic just watching real time it really 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 is man i don't even know how people especially family members could deal with seeing their loved ones you know go in such a manner man it's absolutely heinous to watch in real time i'm not going to lie let me just quickly move this camera a little bit so it's not looking too strange but yeah so you see them basically grasping for air, absolutely, you know, scared, witless and stuff, which is completely understandable. And everybody around them feeling completely helpless. 
that's the thing that's absolutely scary about it. Like they're breaching out for help. They're crying for help. Some of them are moaning and groaning. Some people are climbing the walls and stuff. I saw some guy was able to escape by climbing the wall. He probably had to step on some people in order to survive. It's just horrendous to see in real time. Absolutely horrendous. Um, and it happened so quickly. Do you know what I mean? So many people's lives just gone in an instant. And I think part of the kind of COVID legacy, I think, has been this detachment we have with like death tolls. I remember when I saw the original number, it didn't really hit home with me until I watched the video. Then you can actually see how many people were in that crowd. Um, and even then, you know, there were still many people that eventually survived. So kind of odd, like similar, like the flipping Astro World tragedy, where essentially, even though a lot of people died, I think Astro World was like 10. It feels like it should have been more considering how the crowd was. So it was actually a fortunate thing. Like God, you know, thank God no more, more people didn't pass away. And the same thing happened with this tragedy in South Korea. You look at the crowd of people in there, so jumpy, so jam packed. For sure, it's more people should have probably died and they didn't, luckily. Um, but I can't imagine what it's like for a parent having to flip and get that call. Your kid went out for a party. You keep had to go hang out with some friends and it looks like you know that place where they were in korea yes people were going to bars and stuff but it looked like some people were just out in the streets um stunting and looking cool i think i saw a video of one guy who was like a live streamer um who kind of streams you know the whole day um out and about and he was streaming himself in a crowd and he didn't think it was that big of an issue then his face started to change when he started to realize oh no this is actually crushing me so you can only imagine the amount of people who were just out just to kind of show face and be seen so they weren't all going to bars they all just some of them were just loitering so ugh, not lo just hanging around basically yeah. and if i read correctly that particular region or that particular district in south korea is where all the bars and clubs are and restaurants and whatnot and i guess in that part of southeast asia they were pretty strict with covid regulations so the you know the 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 the, re the restrictions of like bars and nightlife and whatnot have only recently been relaxed like super in the way that everyone could just go out and have fun so this was the first time bars and clubs were basically looking forward to basically recouping or making back or trying to get back on their feet pertaining to how long they've been out with covid and whatnot so you can just imagine having people were out you know the bars and pubs are looking up for are looking forward to welcoming the punters the punters are looking forward to going to places where they weren't able to go prior <sighs> just absolutely horrendous it continues says Choi Song Byum, head of the Yus Yong San fire station, told a briefing at the scene that 82 people were injured, 19 of them seriously. The death include 22 foreigners, he said. Families and friends desperately saw word of loved ones at the community center turn into facilities of missing people. I'd imagine South Korea, is, especially now with the popularity of K-pop and the popularity of the country overall, I'd imagine there'd be a lot of foreigners there, especially from the UK. So I can't imagine how horrifying and scary it is to try to figure out if one of your family members is actually over there and was you know included in this flipping tragedy i hope not for whoever's sake is listening but god almighty man um, at least 90 percent of the victims had been identified as by midday with delays affecting some foreign nationals and teenagers who did not yet have identification cards makeshift memorials began appearing near the site with onlookers believe leaving flowers and notes president yoon expressed condolences to the victim and his wishes to the speedy recovery of many injured in one of south korea's worst disasters and the world's worst stampede in decades this is truly tragic he said in a statement a tragedy disaster that should not have happened and in a place of a heart in the place in the heart of seoul last night so yeah man thoughts and feelings of everybody out there who's kind of suffered from this man's absolutely tragic news and i can't imagine what people over there are going through but i just thought i just kind of highlight that before we continued on with the rest of the conversation we're gonna have here then i wanted to speak about an album i've been listening to since it dropped the other day and absolutely love from an artist that i at first didn't get at first i have to be honest i thought lancy foe was like a was like a, a bit of a young fuck beg, a bit of a carty beg, his style, um, you know, his, his, even his hair, the way he kind of inflections on his voice, or the effects on his voice, some of the beats he was choosing, it kind of felt like he was doing like a UK version of that. And for the longest time, which is absolutely funny, who's, who's the other guy? I forgot his fucking name now. The one that's been accused of um, doing uh, the madness with that girl. I forgot his name. But that kid who was the model for Supreme, and I forgot his name now, when I remember it, or if you do, put it in the comments. 
at the time when they were both coming up, he was the preferred one. And Lancey was kind of, like I said, the one that people were kind of looking at, like the UK designer. Remember when the designer was coming up, everyone was looking at him like he was just cutting or copying Future's flow, his cadence, even his voice sounded similar. But the thing that I wanted to say categorically is that this is why it's important to give artists a chance because you never know if, if an artist is going to turn out to be a Lancey foe or is going to turn out to be a designer. Because I think Lantifo did start out maybe idolizing and looking up to people like a young thug and a Playboy Carti. Because why wouldn't you? Because they're two people in their kind of, you know, niche of whatever music they make, however you describe it. They're two of the leaders in it, right? They do it the best. No one can imitate or copy what they do in any way, shape or form. So it makes sense for someone as young as Lantifo to look at them and think, hey, this is where I want to go. Especially someone like Playboy Carti, who they might be the same age or in the same kind of age group. And then maybe the young thugs are bit older you've got some peers there that you can kind of look at because i think peers are usually like two years above two years under or something in that group right but still it's motivation it's mentorship from afar it works out but you never know who's going to develop and who's going to actually evolve the artistry clearly this kid lancy folk cares about his music he cares about his artistry he cares about his vision how he, even the covers right are really interesting he even goes to an effort to design and put together pretty decent single covers which is usually a good sign that somebody really cares about their craft and isn't just phoning it in and putting stock images that they find on flipping you know what uh, getty images or wherever they find these flat crappy images and um i really like this album life in hell and i have to say having listened to all these albums all these eps this might be his magnus opus i've said it before on twitter i'll share it again here this life in hell is lancy foe's magnus opus this is his greatest work this is a this is the best representation of his sound the best representation of what he presents or what he offers as an artist especially as a uk artist because for the most part the uk is kind of dominated by like what afro beats um uk rap drill and that's basically it right there's not really else much else you can do in terms of movement even my piano hasn't really taken off in a way that it has done in other places like especially in south africa you know we don't really have our own you know artists here who are really smashing it we might have some nights and stuff but the Ama piano scene hasn't really popped off that well here but afro beats uk rap and drill is really the kind of the forebearers and the leaders in terms of pushing things forward of course grime is still there but in terms of actually influencing culture i think those three i mentioned prior are the ones that are really doing it so it's quite nice when you hear someone like a Lancey Foe basically do his version of whatever's happening in the States at the moment. And that's what I like about it is that it doesn't necessarily sound like it's coming through an American lens. It kind of sounds like somebody, and it also doesn't sound like an expat. I don't know how to describe it. It sounds very grounded in what we do here in the UK. And it kind of makes you proud that we kind of have somebody who's able to kind of... Um, battle in that kind of arena with the playboy carties the uzis and stuff because i'd put him up there i don't care he hasn't maybe got the discography as some people would say but i think in terms of those two leaders he's definitely in that kind of conversation he could definitely hold his own in that regard um the musicality the melodies uh the structure of the songs um the fact that he's got these random interludes that are not interludes where he's just croning and just adding an effect and just singing it's beautiful absolutely beautiful and i think um one of the tracks that kind of stands out to me that I've been absolutely playing on repeat when I've been in the flipping gym is this track here called 12th Hour. It really hit home for me, especially now going through flipping Sober October, abstaining from all the um, madness that I've been on. And there's a bar here, if I'm not mistaken. Is it here? Is this the one? It must be the one, right? Where he's like money and something. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, this is the one. So 12th, um, 12th Hour. Uh, on the album Life in Hell by Lancey Foe is definitely my standout because there's this bar here which I absolutely love that really I feel like speaks to me um, especially during you know flipping COVID times and it's a verse here that starts off saying I close my eyes I'm seeing my life in front of me I own my vibe look afar look wide ain't nothing under me in disguise I can't let them uncover me look in her eyes I see her she's in love with me Ride or die, she says she's gonna walk in blood. Rise and shine every day that I'm under the sun. What's gonna be my fate? Is it money or drugs? I'ma be a late to my death. I was busy getting stuck, stuck, stuck. You don't understand, you don't understand. You don't understand, yeah, yeah. Oh, you don't understand, you don't understand. You don't understand, yeah, yeah. Even singing that now just gets me my feels. But this bar right here, what's gonna be my fate? 
is it money or drugs money or drugs and this has been my flipping conundrum from minute zero you know i like to enjoy myself i like to go out there and party and have a good time but i've also got you know a burning ambition to make it in life and to achieve all my dreams and to basically pull myself out from the flipping depths of poverty and you know rewrite the narrative of my flipping family and whatnot and my lineage and whatnot and kind of break whatever generational curse of flipping poverty that might exist and hovering over us you know like most african families we have these weird superstitions that exist and stuff but just in general just kind of set a new flipping precedent and create generational wealth and shit and all these kind of you know grandiose delusions of grandeur that i may have or plans or hubris whatever you may be calling it is really at odds when it comes to my lifestyle right because i like to go out and have fun and that stuff doesn't necessarily um doesn't necessarily go well with ambition and dreams and, and all that stuff you need to be focused and unfortunately for most of us we're not ozzy osborne we're not keith richards we can't you know it's only recently, I think Ozzy Osbourne from time he had his recent health scare, but only recently that guy was still racking up lines, allegedly, was still swigging whiskey, allegedly, and still having a good time. And But then he had his recent health scare and he had to, you know, rein it back in again and be a little bit more sensible. And I think most of us would wish we could be Ozzy. Most of us wish we could be Keith Richards, but we can't. We're not those people. We don't have the, the minerals. We don't have the DNA. Uh, we haven't got it. So we have to balance it or we have to basically abstain from one to get the other thing. And much like, you know, the often maligned Gary Vee, who's actually got some points. I know he might be a little bit, you know, full of shit sometimes. But one thing that stuck out to me that I remember him saying a long time ago, was that if you actually want to achieve your dreams, you just have to be honest with yourself and say, especially if you're working a full-time job or doing other things, you have to commit the free time that you have to your dreams. That's the only way you're going to get to do it. There is no waiting for the perfect time. There is no saving up money, quitting and then starting your dream. No, do it right now. The only time you can do it is the times that you're free. So it's from like six to 12 is your time to kind of do your dream and do your dream chase, which is difficult to do every day, especially if you have a family, you have friends, you have obligations, it's hard to make it work. But it's the only way to get it done because the other way indulging yourself in the money and indulging yourself in the drugs uh, you know which i would just which i would attach to the um the darker side of things the nightlife side of things the hedonism side of things the materialistic side of things isn't going to get you where you need to go so you're gonna have to sit there one day and decide hey should i spend my hundred uh, my last hundred quid on a new jacket or should i get these pictures printed should i get this f this picture f framed should i inquire about a gallery to whatever what you have to think about these things constantly and the hard truth the hard reality of it is you know in order to get the money you basically need to give up the drugs or put it to one side it just is what it is so when i heard this guy croning what's going to be my fate is it money or drugs money or drugs yeah yeah i am absolutely feeling it and swaying from side to side thinking you know this is going to be this this is it this is my guy man so i'm for it 100 percent. and going back to the actual album track list i don't think you'll find a better i'm gonna say I don't think you're going to find a better one, two, three, four, five, six track back to back spinning ever. Because I like that a lot with albums. When you go, sometimes some, out, some artists don't do it. They don't actually focus on the sequencing and don't really care. They just put all their favorite tracks on, on an album, don't care what order they're in, and then you just listen to them. But some artists, I think Lancey Foe included, he sequences it in a way where there is a kind of a flow and a theme, you know, so you can, it's basically telling a story without being too overt and having unnecessary skits. So I think there's no better run than from track four all the way to track nine 12 hour sun moon colors girl and gun i feel like i'm sorry i feel like i'm me all night long like incredible incredible tracks and to be honest the tracks with the features might be the worst on there which goes to show how strong of an artist he is um the j star one i'm not really you know i'm not i don't really not that offended by i know a lot of fans on the subreddit are really going hard at j star and flipping saying he ruins the song but i don't really mind him too tough but i think the rest of the features the cage and other features i could probably live without them as good as they are the zero seven shakes feature as well feels a bit weird it feels like a song that maybe zero seven shake had on she was planning to put on her album that she wanted last year to jump on but she never used it and then he basically claimed it or something it feels like one of those kind of tracks it doesn't necessarily fit with anything it kind of i would have preferred to have heard this is what i think in my head i would have preferred to have heard zero seven shake on a lancey foe type beat as opposed to lancey foe on a zero seven shake type beat do you know what i mean 
especially if it's on his album. I would have preferred it that way. Because if he's going to be on her album, fair enough. But if it's a this album, that's why it makes me think that most likely this was a feature she wanted to put on her own album, but it didn't work out. And then she kind of switched it. And or it, maybe it's not coming out yet. I don't really know. So the Kate and others features, I'm not really too too big on, to be completely honest. Um, but I like the rest of it. And I think the rest of it is absolutely solid. The only thing I'd say is another sticking point that I would say just a little nitpicky thing. The Spirit of Two XC is really cool like as a track opening track to kind of get you in a mood but i find it odd that the sample with wiley is at the end i think or did it again i'm pretty sure it's at the end i did it again there's a really cool sample um of a voice note wiley basically saying that lance is his guy yeah there's a go at the end of it right there's an outro with wiley on it on the second track which doesn't make sense because on the on the actual voice mode itself, Wiley's like, oh, you better put this at the start of your album, right? One of those kind of things. And I think it would have worked really well at the end of Spirit of Ecstasy. As he's croning, you hear flipping, you know, Wiley's voice just piercing or just leaking through that track and leading into I did it, did it again. I think that would be pretty hard. But for some reason, he put it at the end of that track, which should be at the end of the first track. That was the only thing that was a bit weird. But... Honestly, man, this album is really, really amazing. This is this is Lancey Foe's Magnus Opus. For me, it's a 10 out of 10, even with those other things included. Like I said, get rid of the Cage Nada tracks and I'm ready to roll. The 07 Shake track, I can kind of leave it to one side. The rest of it, absolutely heavenly. Um, 12th Hour is definitely my my banger. Um, Lancey or Lancey is definitely another one. What an absolutely incredible hook, man. This song actually, this is going to go off on the live show. Oh yeah, talking about live show. He's performing on what? November 17th and 18th, I think at Earth. I think the last show on the Friday is sold out, but the first show on the Thursday is still got tickets available. So check it out if you're interested. I'm definitely going to be at one of the shows. I think I'm going to try to get the last show on the Friday tickets just because it's a Friday. Why not go a bit crazy, watch him perform, go into a mosh pit, sing the songs, you know, word for word, see what it's like performing live. And the one thing I'm also not going to do because I, I like the, I like the bit of mystery because I'm not too sure. And even on the album, the bits and pieces where it felt like he might have broken up with his um, supermodel entrepreneur girlfriend who, are, you know, they're kind of known to be really stunty and, you know, look amazing together in terms of their outfits and just looking incredibly attractive. I'm not too sure if they're actually broken up or not. I don't want to research it and find out anything, but there were some bars in the album that made me think, you know, he might be newly single. I don't know. But I'll, I say that to say... I like it when you just listen to an album just on the strength of the music. You don't really dig too deep into the guy's background, where he's from. I don't give a fuck. I'm just listening to it purely from an artistic point of view and it's fucking pulling at my heartstrings. It's got me. So just imagine if I find out some stuff about him and it fucking, you know, it marries up with how I view the world or whatever. I'll be like, ah. But yeah, Lancey Foe, Life in Hell, absolutely phenomenal album. Cannot wait to see the guy live. I'm really hoping it's a good live performance. I'm hoping he's not going to perform with a backing track. Please don't perform with a vocal backing track. I beg you. I want to hear his flipping breathing. I want to hear him being out of breath. I want to hear him mispronouncing words. I don't give a fuck. I much prefer all my rappers to perform with an actual instrumental without performing with the back and track because at that point you might as well listen to it at home but um i think it's going to be a good show i haven't searched anything i don't know what it's going to look like but i think it's going to be a good show so i'm really looking forward to that but i recommend if you haven't already please check out lancey first life in hell it might be my album of the year especially heading into the end of the year now we're at the business end this might be end of the year and the fact that drake and flipping 21 savage didn't drop that weekend too was a blessing i think for him because all ears and eyes especially for me were on him because i was really looking forward to that drake and 21 album and also i think um What's his face? Metro Boomin was meant to come out that day too. So a lot of big hitters were, you know, kind of pushed their albums back. This dropped, I think it might have dropped the same weekend as Flipping Taylor Swift, but I'm not listening to Taylor Swift, am I? So that didn't really matter. So big up Lance Hufo. What an incredible album. Life in Hell, definitely a Magnus Opus, a 10 out of 10 for me. And I can't wait to see that kid live. Then the next thing I want to talk about in terms of music is Fred again. Fred again. I was listening to him uh have an interview with Zane Lowe um and I enjoyed the interview I thought he came across really well but there's a part of me that just couldn't buy it I couldn't buy into him as a person I don't know what it is he just seems too nice he just seems too personable he just seems like somebody you want to root for and want to see win but it's just a part of me the cynical side of me that's sitting there thinking nah there's something there's something off about this guy 
And then I remembered Fred again was the same guy that I covered in that other story in my podcast about um, this DJ. I think her name is Bambi or Bammy. I forgot it. One or the other. Bambi or Bambi. Bambi or Bammy. One of them who was DJing somewhere on the same bill as Fred again and the Blessed Madonna, formerly known as uh, the Black Madonna. And she got there on time to do a set. And essentially both of those artists basically prevented her from playing because they were too in the zone and didn't want to let her play because they were feeling the vibe and they just wanted to continue on. And I thought it was really horrendous because I think as an up-and-coming DJ myself, I've been in a position before where you're basically supporting a really big artist. You're either opening or closing and they either try and eat into your opening time because they want to get on or they don't ever come off at the end because they're really in a mood now or they're high or they're drunk, whatever it may be. So you don't have a chance to play yourself. So you basically waste your whole day. They're just waiting for them to finish and to check, to kind of get off the decks. And usually if they're the higher caliber person, no one in management wants to tell them anything because they're the star. So you're there waiting, you know, holding your flipping nuts in your hand. And by the time you get on to play, you've got 20 minutes left. And I think the same thing might have happened to this girl that I'm talking about. I think she might play for longer, maybe it's 45 minutes. But the really egregious part of it is they didn't apologize none of them did not publicly anyway and this is also a little bit i think it might have happened a little bit before that thing happened with carnage who, who's changed his name in it what's his name now is it, it's still carnage anyway we know that dj right who's associated with drake and we had some credits on um his house album and he obviously got involved in that passer which i cop covered on my podcast where he essentially did the same thing but he did it with chest these guys fred again and bless madonna i'm pretty sure they kind of said no to coming off through their agents and I think just like by ignoring, they didn't really say I'm not coming off. I think the other guy, Carnage or Cardo, I think his name is, he basically said it with chess. No, I'm not coming off. I'm playing until the end. And, you know, the internet kind of cancelled him while going after him, getting these comments, harassing him. And he essentially did a good thing. You know, he kind of made it about him and the apology, but he made it right. He basically said, I'm sorry. He admitted his fault. He basically explained it, which I thought was hilarious, him explaining why he fucked them over. And then in the end, he basically said, hey, if you want to come and see another show of mine, VIP tickets or whatever it may be, or something, play on my set. I forgot what it is, but he basically apologised and acknowledged it publicly and i don't think fred again or bless madonna ever acknowledged it so for some reason i think that might be tainting how i look at this kid and how i kind of view his art because you know when you do things like that for me it's sort of similar to like you know this story recently we had about james corden going to that restaurant baltazar in new york and him and his wife basically kicking up a fuss and being really horrendous patrons and, you know, complaining about stuff and, you know, throwing a fit over stuff that could easily be fixed. I think one of the issues was something about the egg whites running into the, or the yolk running into the flipping egg whites or something, um, something about her hair and sh like crazy stuff, right? And it just came across like really entitled, arrogant cunts and it kind of tells you everything about them as people so when i hear these stories about you know bless madonna and fred again it kind of makes me think behind that kind of nice you know i'm just a nice nice guy from north house from north of like england or wherever he's fucking from just trying to make music and rem, you know remember the memory of my friends and all this sort of cute stuff that behind it there's like a bit of sinister evilness going on there that would make you want to you know not let somebody play who's booked on the same bill as you especially if you're an up-and-coming person you know what the fucking hustle's like you know how hard it is to to get on that stage you know how hard it is to build up your career to get to a point where you're at where you're at where you're headlining stuff so you know the grind you've been to hotel lobbies and seen a dj play in a lounge and you know for flipping 10 people who don't care you know what the grind is like so you should be you know understanding but i guess some people when they get to a certain level they don't understand anything so that's the thing that left a bit of a sour taste in my mouth but anyway moving on i obviously saw what we all saw i saw the boiler room we all saw the boiler room right and I think, yeah, we definitely all saw it, bruv. It's fucking, it's at 7.9 million views. And then, first of all, when I saw it, um, I wasn't aware that this guy did fucking, you know, live performance when he did his fucking DJing or his performing. I thought it was just a basic CDJ guy. But then I remembered, oh, shit, this is the same guy that produced that EP with Heady One that I absolutely hated. So it kind of gave me another reason why I'm probably a little bit cynical on it, dude, because that Heady One EP, when that came out, I was like, oh my God, no, they're going to try and turn Heady One into fucking Pitbull or something and give him these horrible fucking electronic music flipping records that are only going to be played in fucking Miami and it sounds horrendous. But having watched this guy perform live 
on Boiler Room, you know, in front of a crowd that clearly gets and connects with what he does, it kind of made me think, okay, this guy's a little bit sick and he's a bit special. Let's not lie. The guy is flipping special. And I think we all know the track that stands out in that set was definitely this um, Fred against Sujish House Mafia, Turn on the Lights, uh, future record, right? Which for me is kind of... Um, justifies why I always kind of thought like why aren't there more um dance music especially when it comes to like techno and EDM and maybe even you know just regular dance records that sample more hip-hop tracks especially vocals because I think there are so many cool vocals nowadays that people could sample that would sound amazing just even strip away anything on the actual song itself or just take the sample itself because a lot of these guys I always spoke about Lancey Fo and his melodies and the way they use their voices as instruments there's already an instrumentation value on or kind of tone on their voice by how they harmonize and their croning as their ad-libs so you can essentially use that voice voice um or the vocal itself on the record and it could kind of go where you want it to go but it could also fr form the structure of your flipping song and how it kind of fits in terms of the beats and shit and obviously that sweet house mafia track with flipping future and stuff it just sounds amazing right turn off the lights i'm looking for her. and you d no verse you just get that fucking that what was it that hook or that chorus bit like blows your mind and obviously it's fucking amazing but it also made me think immediately about this track that I remember hearing randomly on this um, set from 2019 at Untold. And if I'm not mistaken, this set features Jamie Jones and uh, Jamie Jones and Martinez Brothers and Seth Trucks are playing back to back. If I'm not mistaken, this was meant to be live streamed, but something happened with the equipment. So they only was able to live stream half an hour worth of it. But this was a really good set. And um, of course, these guys are kind of really commercial. They're probably occupy the business techno side of things but i remember hearing this track that samples um 21 savages x x bitch which features also a future on it also and it sounds incredible i think seth trucks is the one mixing it in so i'm gonna play it now hopefully it doesn't get flagged but if it doesn't get flagged it doesn't matter but i think this track is amazing and also goes to show that you know that as good as that fred again track is i think there's evidence that this stuff clearly works so if you're a producer out there please take vocals from hip-hop tracks and make them into fucking booming tech house tracks um tools techno tools ebm tools electro tools whatever it may be because you know we need them on the dance floor Hold up. 
so amazing for me an amazing record and it kind of reminded me i was reminded of it when i obviously heard that absolutely booming track with fred against Suicide house mafia uh featuring flipping future turns of lights but on the actual album itself man i know like i said before that whole issue with the DJ thing made me have a sour taste in my mouth about this kid. Um, the whole thing with the Heady One album or that EP was horrendous. I threw that straight in the bin. But this, Actual Life Free. And I'm even not even a fan of this whole, like the whole voice notes thing and the clips and stuff and, and you know, the, the forced emotion and whatnot in it. But you can't help but feel something. That's an annoying thing. It feels calculated. It feels intentional. It feels almost manipulative, right? The 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 thing, the voice, the fucking emotion, the voiceness of it, the fact that he fucking names the tracks after the people that are fucking, you know, helping to do it and stuff. And it's all a personal connection. And he's featuring people on here that I will legitimately have like under five thousand followers. And he's putting them on his on his fucking album because he just loves what they do. And you're discovering all these new people through this one guy. It, it's incredible that way. But you kind of feel like you're being manipulated but you don't care because the music's so good like one of the standout tracks i said about five thousand followers one is this track here called winnie end of me like track 12 like incredible legitimately incredible the kind of track you if you used to hear that performed live you legitimately might cry especially if you're on the right sort of drugs honestly and then there's a track here that i like one of my favorites track four cami like i do incredible booming almost funky house type feeling track like just a complete vibe like that will definitely get you to fucking you're definitely going to get sturdy listening to that sort of shit so i don't know man i'm still a little bit on the fence about the kid but i think he's special i legitimately think this kid has got it like legitimately he's special on a level where like if he just keeps doing what he's doing he might change things forever in dust music but I just, you know what I mean? I'm finding it hard to kind of fully get into it and like it because everyone else likes it. And it's so fucking bait and commercial. But the guy is really good. Like, he's incredibly supremely talented artist, talented producer. There's bits in it where it's allegedly it's his voice singing. I, I'm not sure if that's true. When I looked at the credits, I said it. I'm like, oh my God, can he actually sing as well? He's just an absolute beast. So I can't wait to see what he does going forward in his career. But actual free actual life story free bravo again i'm not that well clued in with his discography like i said i was kind of you know i kind of went sour off him based on what i said earlier on but this is gonna make me go back into the flipping archive it's also gonna make me want to maybe go to a live show i know the tickets are sold out but i'm definitely be able to get one again you know you can always get some again on the resale sites like ticket swaps and stuff um on the day but I might have to see what he does live and see him again and see his full power to see what I'll go on because this kid is a bit special, mate. Actual Life Free is absolutely incredible. So check it out if you haven't already. Actual Life Free by Fred again. Give him a chance. Give him a chance. Next on the list I quickly want to mention, we have an update regarding an issue I spoke about prior regarding clubs in Ireland being able to open until 6 a.m., it says, yeah, it's going to happen. Irish ministers agreed to extend opening hours until 6 a.m. So it's finally on the docket. And like I said previously, this gives me an excuse to go over to the great country of Ireland and go and rave and party because that's something I've been doing quite often when it comes to my techno tourism. I love to kind of go to far flung places to go and listen to the music and see the artists that I know and love. Sometimes you'll see even the artists I know just to kind of experience a new place and what better excuse than to go clubbing. So it says here as follows, I, this is courtesy of RA, Ireland is set to overhaul its century-old alcohol licensing laws, meaning nightclubs can stay open until 6 a.m. It's crazy that we think this is a privilege, isn't it? This is actually doing us a favor, but like I, like I say many times, you go over to Berlin and some places don't get going until 4. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like crazy. On Tuesday, 25th of April, of October, so what's wrong with me and my reading? At Dublin's Royal Hibernian Academy Gallery, Minister Justice Ellen McEntee gave a speech detailing the general scheme of the sale of alcohol bill. Though the bill has been published and approved by the Cabinet, is yet to be passed in legislation. This is expected next year. Our licensing laws are out of date for the requirements of modern society, says McEntee. Under the reforms we're announcing today, we will instead have one 
modern piece of legislation to regulate the sale of alcohol. For nightclubs, this means having the option to stay open until 6 a.m. with no alcohol sales past five, which is standard. Owners will apply for a nightclub permit, which will be issued by the district courts on an annual basis. Conditions include having CTTV outside the premises and security registered with private security authority. That's a little bit authoritarian, a little bit Orwellian, but hey, you got to be got to do to get raving, get people raving late and doing bumps as late as possible. This represents a marked improvement on the current system whereby owners and promoters must apply for costly special exemption orders um, every time they throw a pie. Something we have here is also, that's usually what happens when they kind of are about to shut a place down. They make you apply for these things all the time. The application's long. You have to wait for, you know, to get approved or not. And then over time, you just get bored and tired of applying. You just stop and then eventually your place closes. Um, closing time is at 3 a.m. According to McEnt, the number of clubs in Ireland has dwindled from 300 in 2009 to only 80 oh my god 80 <sighs> nightclubs are an integral part of the life of the city she said clubbing culture is what strives creativity and shapes attitude of course and just boost the flipping nighttime economy that brings in a lot of extra money why not i especially in booming city centers already with loads of restaurants and you know and whatnot and takeaway places just have a couple of clubs open late mate give those guys an extra ability to make some extra cash that then spills over to taxi places and whatnot that might spill over to people actually deciding to move there permanently anyway local artist activists Samuel sharp and robert kitt who represent the influential campaign group give us the night attended the briefing of the building of the department of justice on tuesday and they said it's going to happen sharp told resident advisor our permit puts this very clear division between the bar and nightclub sectors i love that because that's what something they they basically swindled us in in london they flip in switch the flip with nightclubs especially in dawson they switched the flip switch the, the the flip the uh, the switch sorry with us with nightclubs in dawson in east london overall where they basically closed all the nightclubs or gave them or put them under a thing where they could only apply for a special exemption thing which basically killed them death by a thousand cuts but then they upped the amount of bars and then upped the amount of restaurants we had and most restaurants and bars we have in london they play music anyway so there's either a dj or a playlist playing which is fucking annoying so it's blaring into your fucking eardrums while you're eating your fucking you know lasagna um but essentially they did that as a way to kind of um get around the idea of not having as many nightclubs um, which obviously isn't the same because those places are still going to close at 12 and 1 and it's not, you know, you're not going to party sitting down eating your fucking steak, ta It's not the same thing. Um, so I like how they had the division between clubs and nightclubs. For the first time, we're actually being properly recognised in legislation as a standalone venues of our own. That's quite significant, something we've wanted for a long, long time. Crucially, the bill also proposes to phase out the century-old extinguishing rule within three years of the bill passing. The rule means anyone wanting to open a pub or venue can only do so by buying an existing license from a license holder not the state this makes it very hard for new operators to enter the market amazing we want the new blood coming into the industry call cool to here we need more than 50 to 60 operators many of whom aren't even passing these venues onto their kids anymore when we loosen up these laws people might start to think differently amazing the bill also includes a modification on existing free theater, the theater licensing license sorry called the cultural amenity license which would allow spaces such as galleries theaters and museums to serve alcohol open late and host night events how come you can't have that already bro that's a, such an again you know i had such an amazing time during the early parts of like 2010s and stuff or maybe i don't know maybe it was 2015 ish when i used to go to the first fridays because we have our thing in east london called first thursdays or last Thursdays, i forgot which one it is where all these galleries around east london or parts of london in general will open up um they'll do private views until late so you could go there and have a drink and stuff and see an exhibition. It might be an exhibition that's already running or it might be a new exhibition to kind of get people more through the doors and kind of get them in and around art and stuff. And it's always really cool because you get to see really cool interesting people, see cool artwork, be inspired for a bit, have some wine, chit chat and keep it moving. Um, but it kind of it kind of brought the city to life. And I remember it happening in South London, it being a big thing where you'd go on these guided tours, you'd, you'd discover all these cool galleries. It made, especially some of them myself being an East London native. I never go to East South anyway, so... Most of these galleries are located in places that are quite residential. Um, so you'd be going into the depths of South London and discovering all these new places. It was cool. It was great. You got to stay out there late. You got to partake or give back to the local economy because usually after the you know gallery things, we'd go to a bar, we'd go and eat at a nice restaurant and whatnot. Those things will happen 
consistently you get a cab from there like all these cool things will happen so the fact that this wasn't already a thing is really annoying but you know um it's never too late the other major reform is that pubs will be able to stay open until 12 30 a.m seven days a week the closing time for late bars will remain at 2 30 that's really cool for pubs and bars and what it does as well as you can see here with the times, you've got 12.30 for pubs, you've got 2.30 for bars, and then you've got 6 a.m. for clubs. What that should help doing is ease the flipping flow of people spilling out into the streets. Because one thing that I've never understood, especially with places that have really strict, or cities and towns have really strict licensing laws or late you know, laws in terms of opening, is that it actually hurts the city and local residents because if you have everyone spilling out at the same time that's what actually breeds and kind of is the breeding ground for antisocial behavior everyone high drunk um annoyed you know covered in whatever they're covered in outside in the street wanting to party to continue and get into all sorts of passa it kind of reminds me of that famous fucking picture someone took that looks like a renaissance painting of all these different scenes of one guy splayed on the floor one girl helping a friend get up a police car somebody's you know smashing each other on the side of the wall that thing happens in most cities around the country on a weekend basis because everyone spills out into the streets at the same time usually 12 30 maybe sometimes sooner so when you have staggered times like pubs closing at 12 30 that will mean people won't be going to the club people won't be going to the pub so late or they won't be trying to neck their beer so quickly because what i realized when i went to hastings to visit a friend a long long time ago was that in hastings because all the pubs closed sooner but then the bars closed you know maybe 2 30 or 1 and maybe there's one nightclub that finished at 4 what people would do is that they'd go to the pubs and because the pubs were closed early they would have promotions on to get more people through the doors and to sell more booze so you'd be downing your drinks at the pub until 11 then you get chucked out of the pub and you go to a bar that also has a promotion to make you drink more because they only open until two then you go there and get chucked out and then you go to the club so by the time you go to the club or even by the time you go to the bar you're already steaming you might be six pints in 12 pints in before you get to the bar and nightclub and you're absolute mess so you're not going to be the best um patron in there but the security guards also going to let you in because they're under destructions for the management to let you in because you're a paying punt and you're going to put more cash behind the till so it's just a a kind of cyclical issue so if they could have those staggered you know closing times it would really help to kind of make things easier for everybody uh, you would hope so anyway in terms of legislative process the bill is now being scrutinized by the whatever that word is c a justice committee which may need to consult with stakeholders on various areas of reform once complete the bill will go before parliament to be voted on and passed into law in the meantime an imp implementation sorry an impl implementation group made up of members of the revenue commissions um courts and services and department of justice will meet to look to ways of reducing the current cost of the structure and road licensing we are happy that this bill is almost there but the department of justice truly has to prioritize this legislation and get it um, as early as possible into 2023 as possible the, the open-ended prediction of next year isn't good enough there's no reason why this can't be enacted into law by the opening months of 2023 he added let people experience the joys of these laws once and for all and talk and announcements are starting to wear thin now and there are many venues hanging on by a thread who need to changes who need these changes who need the changes this very minute visited okay cool so i'm looking forward to it like i said i'm i'm really for it i hope this gets passed into law so i'm you know fingers and crossed toes um for all my island guys out there and gals and people like myself you know i'm a london native i usually go to places like fucking berlin all the time or amsterdam and shit to go and rave and party and maybe manchester from time to time but if legitimately they have an option where their clubs open until 6 a.m it makes it far more worthwhile to go at the moment going to a place like ireland and traveling all the way there and paying for accommodation only to stay until four is a bit of a waste of time especially because i don't know anybody so you want to go there you want to actually have a good time meet people get absolutely walloped for the whole weekend and um, stay out as late as possible wake up and then do it all over again the best thing to do is obviously to have it open until 6 a.m and of course people like myself will contribute to local economy we're going to be spending money we're going to go into your vintage shops we're going to be going to your sneaker shops and shit your skateboard shops your record stores and whatnot your cafes your restaurants to eat so that will really help and it will get a lot more people to visit a place and who knows maybe even end up moving there and stuff so that could all help so i'm really looking forward to it hope that does work out for them I really do hope that works out for them. Moving on from that one, I want to quickly talk about this. This is courtesy of Hypebeast regarding 
these ambush Nike Air Force Ones. Obviously, you know, Yoon from Ambush has been going through a bit of a madness, especially when it comes to Kanye deciding he wanted to, you know, let everybody know what he thought about her personally, which I think was pretty disgusting. And obviously something you shouldn't be doing, especially somebody you once referred to as a friend. But oddly enough, these unfortunate instances do have a way of kind of getting the public's attention back on you again and maybe highlighting and reminding people what you actually do. And apart from, you know, being attractive and maybe being the the apple of some guy's eyes is helpful to kind of be mentioned because usually i think when some guys go out of their way to mention who some woman fucked or something or allegedly fucked it's usually i feel like a an insecurity thing because they didn't get to do it so they're like you know it's kind of like them in a way it's kind of them um dissing the guy and also dissing the girl like how dare you fuck him over me and how the hell could you fuck her before i did you know that kind of thing as crass as it sounds i think that's usually the thing with it. but anyway it doesn't matter um more attention being brought to her designs and one of the interesting things i think about this is that these air force ones that are going to be i guess releasing soon is there more information on the hype beast uh, article here no real idea on date but essentially you got these two um, ambush designed Nike Air Force Ones uh, which have essentially taken on the same sort of design elements that she did for the dunk that I thought were pretty well done because oddly enough I thought they did really well because those dunks kind of look like Jordans I think that's what people thought but I thought the elonged um, the, the extended sorry swoosh that popped out to the side that looked like it was made of rubber or something so that was pretty cool so there was no chance of it kind of falling off or flapping down or looking weird this heel tab mud guard thing at the back was really interesting little design element added onto it but I think it worked better of course on a dunk because everything felt like it was a little bit it, you know it felt like it was um pinched in and zoomed out a little bit it kind of felt a little bit like an off-white um mock-up but i still like the fact that it was kind of similar to what she was kind of doing the only thing i would have said was a maybe of a little bit thing i would have added onto those dunks maybe it was to make the soles a bit thicker it, those soles are maybe crying out to be double stacked or something because maybe because i remember those dunks maybe come out at the same time the dr martin Jaden boot came out the double sole boot so maybe i'm thinking that but maybe a thicker sole would have gone a long way to change but overall she did pretty well with those and i'm happy with the nikes i think they look pretty decent but if anything maybe a little bit redundant a little bit tired this sort of like um execution maybe she could have done something more interesting especially when it comes to an air force one um i feel like the air force one you know is maybe a model that's been flogged to absolute death and maybe we need to give it a break but if you're an ambush and you're you know doing what you do maybe being given the keys to the um nike design studio you should maybe be doing more interesting things when it comes to silhouettes and maybe choosing more challenging silhouettes maybe trying more interesting and you know and out there things and be more creative and um, that's what i would say with those i'm not really the biggest fan of these but talking about not being the biggest and even the, you know there's other colorways too here in the black and the white that look pretty decent um, if you're into that kind of thing but again for me they're not for me but talking about footwear and being interesting the ones that really stand out for me from Ambush are these that were featured in the spring 2023 collection, right? And that's the thing I think is interesting because I think essentially what Kanye was getting at saying, you know, Ambush stuff is weak because I've kind of said the same thing myself. I'm not really the biggest fan of the clothes she makes and stuff, but because mostly I feel like every season just changes theme and direction completely. There's nothing that really ties any or any of the stuff that she does together, which might be the point, but it feels a little bit schizophrenic. It feels a bit like, it feels like a, your Instagram discovery page. I think there's a couple of brands that do. There's another one called like Number 21. I think that shows that Milana does a similar sort of thing. It feels like they always kind of design based off uh, going on their discovery page and seeing what's trending, see what people are on. And this kind of feels the same. It's sort of like a Y2K sort of vibe. And if you know, you know, most metropolitan cities or even just on your social media, you see a lot of kids, especially Gen Z kids, tapping into that kind of 2000s trends of wearing really gaudy clothes and you know go faster glasses and really bright colors and you know flares and all this kind of stuff right and loads of denim and obviously this kind of collection really jumps on that and kind of exemplifies it and does it in her own way but that aside the interesting part for me is the footwear these boots that have been featured in there are absolutely banging because of course they remind me of my own pair of shoes i've got these new rec boots that i'll actually yeah i want to put i'll actually put a picture up on here so you can see them my actual boots that i own my own new york boots that i've been wearing for many years i always wear them to raves and shit i'm a big fan of them 
And, you know, they're not the most comfortable boots in the world, but I love them for stomping around in raves. And these look like a, the, the fashion alternative, which will probably end up being a bit lighter, a bit easier to wear, way more expensive than my new rocks, don't get me wrong. But in terms of the look, they look absolutely incredible. And that's, a, and that's what makes me think about that Nike collaboration, why I think it's a waste of opportunity, because clearly this lady is incredibly creative and knows what she's doing in terms of creating core cool footwear and silhouettes and stuff that people want, or just clothes that people want, because, you know, as derivative and as kind of trendy as this stuff is, this will absolutely sell out hotcakes, especially if it's priced adequately or in the same section that people buy this sort of stuff would want to buy it. And even the glasses, right? Um, especially what you see happening with Balenciaga and Bottega Veneta and how they're smashing it in the eyewear thing that you, you could tell this would do really, really well. So all that stuff is clearly really great, but these boots, these new rock type looking boots are just incredible, in my opinion. Obviously the outfits, the styling is absolutely great on all of these looks, but these boots I would wear in an absolute heartbeat and I'm really anticipating, eagerly anticipating when these will absolutely come out um in terms of me being able to acquire a pair because i need them i really do like all these outfits uh when them these outfits here when they're all pink but essentially they're uh, a flip on ed even this this look here this is like you know perfect for what you see these kids wearing nowadays kids that go to parties like guthring and stuff will be wearing stuff like this right but those boots are absolutely banging and i love the little detail here with the metal on it like they look basically like an updated version of a new rock boot essentially i think there's two different lengths i think there's a length that goes just underneath your calf and one goes below the knee it, as you can see here i think that one there's the just under the knee one so i, I guess there maybe is a male and a female version maybe it looks like but these are hard like you know i would wear the hell out of these boots mate. absolutely wear the hell out of these boots and i'm really really cannot wait to find out when they eventually do come out so when i see stuff like this that she does as cool as it is i understand but maybe the reason why Kanye would say, you know, your stuff is weak or that stuff ambush is weak is because they're only looking at the street weary type stuff. That's a little bit derivative and a little bit lacking inspiration, in my opinion. Because the dunks were great, but that, that was just a one time thing. Taking that same design, those codes and stuff and applying those in Air Force One's a little bit tired. But when you know, when actual creativity is required and you're meant to do something completely new and fresh on the runway, look what you get from ambush absolutely banging i love those boots i really want those boots i'll do anything to have those boots um maybe even in this sort of outfit or all see-through um it looks like it's made of plastic or something i won't say plastic but what is it um obviously it's been embossed to make it look like a crocodile or leather skin but i'd say i don't know what the material is actually i couldn't even guess to be honest but it reminds me of the video that marcus is it marcus houston wore one time to an award ceremony yeah that kind of outfit on that hat's gonna be absolutely popular all over the place i can see asap rocky wearing something like this i would obviously like to wear it myself but he's probably gonna end up getting it first and then if you get it you look like a fucking beg so i'm just gonna say he's gonna get it but it's basically a bunny banaclava it looks absolutely incredible i'm sure that that'll do really really well when it eventually does come out um got a little dick dick little line here coming in down there love that but the boots are just incredible man so maybe the women's ones go underneath the knees and the men's boots uh they go just above under the calf they come in white and black i guess this silver outfit is all me as well with the shorts i love the entire collection but the boots are just absolutely stupendous look at that look come on man you know i'd, I'd wear the fuck out of that you know i would what, what look is that look number 21 like he, he looks like he's coming out of a video with genuine or some shit that looks absolutely incredible i love that i love everything about it and i really want those boots so 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 badly Oh no, woman is wearing one. See, look, even this fake CD player thing is pretty cool. I'm assuming that CD player is probably a bag. It's not an actual CD player. That would be pretty cool if it did double up as a CD player. But that absolutely looks incredible. I want those boots so badly. So let's see what happens. Hopefully, um, I'll get an idea on when they come out soon. I'm hoping they're also not a thing because sometimes, you know, fashion collections, they'll debut stuff on the runway. And then if no one buys it, you know um from the stores and whatnot they won't put it into production so or puts in orders for it so i'm hoping people see it and put in orders for it but i'm sure they will because this definitely kind of um is on trend with what's happening now people wearing double sole boots but like i said i've been wearing my new rocks for years so i'm always a fan of these flipping big stompers like you can obviously see me you know walking down the fucking streets of london and berlin with these on absolutely feeling myself and thinking i'm the absolute dog's bollocks um, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to them. Like, imagine those boots with the Balenciaga Raver pants. Oh, come on. 
come on don't play with me guys don't play with me so yeah hopefully those come out soon but big up Yoon from ambush ambush spring 2023 looks absolutely incredible i love everything about it like so many great looks um right on trend of what's happening nowadays with the whole y2k ray thing going on at the moment but the standout thing is these boots look at them man they just look so so good no one can deny that i'm all over them right absolutely all over them like flipping salt and chips you can't tell me anything different on that one. You can't tell me anything different. Next, I want to quickly move on and touch on and feature this really cool interview in Fantastic Man, one of my favorite magazines of all time. Um, I've got many, 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 many archive issues or many issues in my archive of flipping fantastic man that i collected back in the day i haven't actually bought a new copy in a while but i've got met probably more than 50 i think in my flipping collection that i used to purchase all the time um i love the interviews i love the range of people that I used to interview i love the intimacy of the interview questions um i love the fact that most people featured on it would say things in fantastic matter wouldn't say in other in other mags the shoots were always really tastefully done and i just haven't really been paying attention to magazines in general the last few years just because i've been kind of tapped out but i was reminded of how great fantastic magazine fantastic man magazine was via this feature that featured um the very influential and popular london designer kiko Konstadinov, who a lot of people are big fans of especially nowadays with the asset stuff that he's done and whatnot and it was funny because reading this interview there was a lot of things i didn't know about the guy that was, was kind of a good to kind of get a refresh on and there's a lot of things that kind of reminded me of a time gone by when i was still kind of you know actively participating in the scene and putting my face around and stuff and being around certain people so i'm going to go through a couple of bits that i thought that were pretty interesting obviously the shoot is flipping beautiful um him with his dog i'm assuming that's his dog um the shoot the whoever who's a photographer um mark peckman was how you say his name mark peckmesian mark peckmesian Mark Peckmesian, um, amazing story about Elliot Horwath, absolutely amazing interview. I'll read the opening line here. It says, uh, Kiko is that particularly exciting and rare entity, an independent fashion designer whose young label is actually self-sustaining. His growing mini empire includes women's wear, diffusion lines, special collaborations, and even a fragrance. But Kiko is a menswear genius first and foremost. His clothes are avant-garde, but pragmatic and wearable. His shoes have a shifted the comfort zone of what men are happy to put on their feet. And he's something of an experimental fashion business men like rick owens or even mr armani so already you know what time they're on in terms of kiko i mean they're going to be going <laughs> clock 1000 but still it doesn't matter i get it it's all it's absolutely incredible and um, one of the things i recognized that i thought was really cool about the interview was his obvious um attention to detail like crazy attention to detail obsessive attention to detail um and also this kind of um desire to be unrelenting in terms of his creativity and how he gets things out there um there are no cutting of corners there are no compromises if there is a compromise or too many compromises then you're absolutely gonna dead the project in the you know before it even begins i also like the fact that there are parts of the interview where he mentions purposely taking a step back or even i think there was the asics conversation uh, around asics like you know doing some really cool collaborations with them with the kiko stamp on it and then he got bored of having a kiko stamp on it and not wanting to dilute his own brand and also not wanting to give people what they actually wanted so now he does like unbranded stuff for them um without the flipping stamp and that just kind of exists within the assets i guess product line and whatever it may be and it kind of reminded me of my heroes that i look up to in kind of japan and tokyo my kind of hiroshi fujiwara nigo and those kind of guys who when they were coming up in that scene there were loads of them even tetsu and shin um all these kind of guys um would essentially or Jun Takahashi, sorry, Tetsu um, from W Taps and Jun from Undercover. Those guys had loads of projects when they were coming up, like loads of little side projects and brands that they did that never really went anywhere, but they did them purposely under the idea of kind of just trying out things and working under a certain pseudonym or a brand name and then kind of killing it before it got too big Just and move on to other things that would obviously create a bit of a... Um, a desire for more create a myst myst um what you call it a mystique around the brand and around the person behind it and again this is before forums and stuff so you're only finding out stuff you know from like shop floor gossip or from reading magazines and shit so all that stuff kind of added to the allure and the hype or the kind of overall appeal of a brand so i like that kiko does the same sort of thing with his 
you know entire empire that he's kind of running so i thought that was pretty cool but then it also reminded me that i've actually had a one no i've had one interaction very very briefly with kiko which is really interesting because at the time i think i was yeah at the time i was working on and helping to build um the virgil labro streetwear program that i did for this previous company i worked at and essentially i was helping to co-produce it with another guy you know building an entire curriculum which is insane because i'm not a flipping teacher or lecturer i went to college went to unionship but i can't you know i don't know nothing about teaching other people but my experience in the scene and the industry and having known different people and being an absolute geek and an absolute kind of obsessive about it kind of made me quite knowledgeable weirdly enough because I knew all these experts so even though I didn't know how to build a curriculum I always had these experts I could kind of call upon to get their kind of insights and kind of run stuff by them so I essentially kind of had a cheat code there so I remember building up the course and the idea behind it at first was to have Virgil leading the entire thing but him being the consummate um, self-awareness king he realized I think at that time his reputation was probably worse than it probably ever was in the history of him kind of doing designs and stuff where a lot of people kind of felt like his success was maybe unwarranted he kind of got there only because of Virgil or because of hype and stuff I don't know it was a weird there's a weird air around people didn't really like the guy too much which was weird because he hardly spoke and he wasn't as you know um, media friendly and he wasn't as kind of out there as he was you know towards the end of his life you know because of his profile and stuff wasn't as big back then but still people didn't really have a good um, uh, view of him as a person and um, so when I was talking to some people they categorically said no because they heard it was Virgil who was leading the program and it was funny too that the gossip around the whole course was spreading before we even announced the launch of it so clearly there's a, there's a lot of like challenge whispers that exist within the menswear streetwear sort of like scene so that was getting out there. And I remember, you know, then him kind of saying to us in a meeting, hey, let's switch it up and have me as the head kind of figurehead, but have all these other experts underneath me who are basically leading the course. But I kind of act as the kind of spiritual guide. I was like, oh, that's a pretty cool idea. So essentially it gave the other mentors the opportunity to come at the forefront. And we had people like Samuel Ross on there. We had Kevin Eng from Brain Dead. Um, I got all these people on board because obviously I, I, I kind of was aware of all of them. So I was able to kind of find them online and basically run them an email, which was pretty sick to talk to these people that you kind of admire from afar. And then, of course, I went to reach out to Kiko. I found I emailed him directly, didn't really get anywhere. And then I think I was at Paris Fashion Week, the first Paris Fashion Week I've ever been to. Um, and the one that kind of made me fall in love with the city because I got to see it through the lens of being an invited quote unquote guest being taken around by locals going to cool restaurants and bars going to a club afterwards like I got to see Paris in a whole different way um, than how I did on my own and I remember we went to like an after party I think for the off-white show if I'm pretty sure the one I went to was maybe the 2017 I forgot what year it was the one with the orange sort of like um, curtains the one with Virgil and, and Ian Connor running down the runway and we went to the after party. It was in some horrible Parisian club that was downstairs where all these Leon lights in it. And Kiko was in there. So it was pretty weird to see this kind of, because he kind of looks how he looks there, right? He's kind of like this disheveled, kind of gloomy, moody looking guy that kind of a bit scruffy looking. And someone you wouldn't really think of seeing in a nightclub. I don't really think he cares about that kind of stuff. But anyway, that's the kind of thing. I, so I remember seeing him thinking, oh shit, he's in like, Kiko's in a fucking nightclub. That's pretty weird. So I went up to him and said, hey, what's up? Da, 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 da. Spoke to him a little bit and, you know, reminded him I, I was the guy that sent the email. And I wouldn't say he big time me, but the response wasn't the greatest, right? But it was kind of on the verge of big time and on the verge of just like, yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Just email me again. Then we went back to London and I remember soon after, just randomly, I don't know why, I think I must have been on his Instagram page at the same time maybe Virgil was showing. And I remember him posting mad, really, really critical stuff about Virgil like, to a point where you could tell he maybe had like a personal issue with the guy. Like he didn't like him at all. He'd be going at him, going, I was like, rotted, this guy fucking hates Virgil, isn't it? Um, so that made me think, you know what? That kind of, kind of put me off him in general because I think at the time I was fairly in the pro Virgil camp but not because of his design because we can all agree that you know maybe his designs weren't the greatest but what I liked about his appointment was always the fact of what it represented and what it could kind of do for future generations the fact that this you know luxury fashion house was basically handing the keys over to a black dude from Chicago to design um, their menswear collection who had no formal experience should give kids who are you know designing you know brands that exist only on Instagram who have no formal training who can't afford to go to fashion 
Christian school, all these kind of things. I think it should give them the flipping hope that that is also possible. So it was never always, it was never really about the quality of the clothes. It was always about what it represented. And I guess, you know, some would argue that why take that opportunity if you're not going to produce at the highest level. But we all can't be key codes because if you read this interview, you'll realise that this kid is a what would you call it he's a I wouldn't say even a is it prodigy is a bad word to say even maybe that's demeaning it this kid's special he's definitely one of them special ones coming up the one the ones that are going to kind of take over some of the legends and be people that you're going to be hearing about for many many years to come you know god willing and shit and he's clearly one of those dudes so he may be being critical or overly of Virgil maybe it's a bit unfair because Virgil wasn't never playing the same game that he was playing um from what he was doing and one of those really cool standout stories that I like that I didn't actually know about was this story regarding the Stussy stuff. And it says, yeah, it's a kind of quote. It says, uh, Kiko has a strong track record in collaborations um, and special partnerships. When he was still an undergraduate at St. Martin's, a place that I went to study product design, might I add, um, he was working as an assistant for stylist Stephen Mann and made a series of custom t Stussy tops that he cut up and reassembled for a shoot. These came to the attention of Michael Copperman, founder of the influential distribution company Gimme Five, an original member of International Stussy Tribe, and also somebody that was involved in the Hideout Store, one of the best stores in London that unfortunately had to close. Had some of the wankiest staff members ever, but one of the best stores ever, and I'm really, I'm really fucking annoyed it closed. After meeting Kiko and seeing his, stu his student work, Copperman proposed an official collection collection that Kiko used to partly fund his master's studies, which is credible, isn't it, right? That he funded his master's studies off the back of those fucking re-engineered um, stushy tops that basically looked like his version of an engineered garment, no, sorry, as a, of, of a needles, sort of like, uh, what, you, what what they call it? Um, reconstructed top. So I think it was a hoodie and I think a sweater and it was featured in one of the Stephen Mann's um, flipping shoots. And the funny thing about the Stephen Mann character too is interesting in a scene thing. I was very aware and familiar with this guy from back in the day on forums. I think he used to post on FUK mostly and another one called Fifth Dimension for him. And, you know, a fairly cordial here and there. And he had a pretty decent blog as well called the non place I think or something on those kind of lines but you know just a scene type of person who was kind of doing his thing styling and whatnot but not somebody I would count as a friend in the slightest but I remember having a pretty sick opportunity where I think he invited I think he was the one that invited me or maybe it was a photographer I'm not too sure but someone invited me to a shoot where he was styling and I think it might have been for a Stussy shoot that unfortunately never came out so I did a bit of modeling for a Stussy shoot where I was kind of pictured in some bucket hat and a polo shirt if I can find it I'll put the picture up on here but um essentially I did that with him and it was pretty sick but apart from that we had no real communication apart from maybe the odd email here and there so the one other thing I wanted to mention because of how annoying the scene is I remember this one time I think it was during the the peak of the pandemic um, and I think you know when everyone was kind of like still in lockdown and I remember the lockdown restrictions easing and most people were just going on walks. Remember that? We'd just go and you'd go outside and walk around your town and just kind of get some fresh air, see some people, get a coffee, go have a drink, and just walk places because you couldn't stay inside places. So I remember one time um, I went to central London um, just to kind of walk around and people watching stuff and just kind of walk and just see whatever's, whatever's open is open. And I guess he was there, <clears throat> but I didn't notice him. You know, when, you know when you're walking and you notice somebody too late? So I think we're in the, the pavement was quite wide. I was on this side, he was on that side. But he noticed me first, but I didn't notice him first. But he noticed me first. I think, why is this guy acting twitchy? I, that's why I felt like, because my eyesight's pretty terrible. So I couldn't even see who it was. Uh, why is this Jesus looking guy acting twitchy? But all I remember the Jesus guy doing is like, imagine we're walking the pavement and there's one half of the, the road, you know, basically it's on the side where the road is. And he was basically trying to do everything he could to look where the, where the cars were, looking down and kind of hiding his face and kind of doing that, scratching his face and walking quickly. It's like, I remember getting up close and it was kind of passing each other. I was like, oh, that's, that's finger magic. That's Stephen Mann. I was like, why is he hiding his face as if like, I'm going to come up to him and say hi, like he's fucking David Beckham. Do you know what I mean? Like, but that's, that's the scene. That's what it does to you. That's the industry. Because he's a pretty well-known stylist and in his own right, he's doing great work. And probably there are many people out there willing to kind of, you know, get on their knees and gargle his nuts, you know, uh, with reason. You probably sometimes ascribe that thing to everybody and think, oh, this guy I haven't seen in ages, he's probably still wanting to get involved in something. He's going to ask me for I don't know what, I don't know, whatever you're thinking in your head, you think it and then you project it. But really and truly, I didn't even see the guy. So that was a thing I remember just thinking, reading his articles, like, oh, fucking, that fucking cunt. Do you know what I mean? Just, just a little annoying things remind me of like why the scene is so fucking annoying. But then you read this story 
and it also inspires you because you realize that these are also the kind of guys who I remember being in fucking pro, in my product design degree course at fucking St. Martin's that used to make me feel super inadequate because these guys would come in and some of them were, you know, older, maybe they're in their 30s and they wanted to come back to uni to get more qualifications so they can increase their earning potential or they were just young kids who were just special. They'll just come in they'll be able to design a whole entire brief for Panasonic remote control in fucking minutes. The presentation will look amazing. Like they'll just, they'll just get it, right? They'll just, they'll just imagine cool, interesting things, like a new way to, organ, a new way to fucking um, organize cheat, cheat, I think, so what, what did some guy did? Some chair organizer thing that he did that you could pick up chairs and play, like in crazy, incredible things. So when I read this story, I'm testing my Kiko, it kind of made me think, okay, cool. This reminds me a lot of people I went to uni with who are really special. Cause I think I'm good at what I do, but there are people who just can just turn it on instantly and be that person. And he clearly was. Um, but it's cool to hear that he was able to kind of, you know, basically fund his studies doing that little Stushi product. But the entire interview itself is absolutely incredible and really cool. And one other bit that really stands out is this bit also regarding the gallery Al Moran. So loads of connections here with stuff that I'm into because Al Moran was the gallery formerly called... Um, called uh, No, his gallery now is called Moran and Moran. But if I'm not mistaken... The gallery before was called Oh Wow, which was which was uh, co-founded by Al Moran and Aaron Bondaroff, who was formerly of a New York thing, formerly Supreme Gang, and used to do some of the modeling for them and stuff until unfortunately got cancelled for doing some untoward thing to a lady in a cab or something. And then his name got taken off the fucking, um, off the, off the, the owners of that gallery. But I guess in 2018, this is a, the quote here regarding Kiko's connection with that gallery. It says, in 2018, um, Kiko met the gallerist Al Moran, who visited a designer studio while he was in town from the States. Immediately, Al Moran said, we just got into it like we'd known each other forever. It was pretty special. Al Moran told me, I would walk out of that meeting knowing that my life had changed. Mm, OTT there, but I get it. Um, but I didn't know how, why, how or why. In 2019, Moran invited Kiko to put on a show at the Los Angeles space. The exhibition named Otto 95.8 took the form of an installation using industrial building materials, the kind Kiko often uses for shopping stores, along with one of clothing pieces. I was blown away, the gallerist told me. He handled the space so well. There were so many artists that called me or emailed me or came in and said, wow, this guy comes in from absolutely nowhere and just drops this bomb on everybody. The two now speak most days and Otto has continued as a free we in collaboration that might take the shape of books objects short films and also has its own clothing line mostly it's just an excuse for us to talk to one another on the phone says moran and if you actually look at the collection itself man it's at, or the exhibition it looks incredible so imagine this coming out of the mind of somebody that just does fashion right you would assume they're quite you know they've got their lane of what they do but you wouldn't you wouldn't think it would look this great especially when they did it for the first time like an actual exhibition so you've got all these cool uh, bits of pieces that you would see obviously on a work site kind of used on there. And just it just looks impressive overall, right? Just in terms of what it kind of displays, what it looks like visually. Um, you can imagine this being filled with all the hipsters in there drinking their fucking red wines and coconut water and absolutely coming over themselves thinking, oh my God, this guy is so amazing. So clearly this looks absolutely incredible. So I can imagine, you can Im you can Im imagine why somebody like Amora and Almora would be super impressed by us be thinking, hey, we need to continue doing this collaboration for a long, long time going forward. So the actual interview itself is absolutely incredible. So definitely check it out if you haven't already um, to get inspired and to get motivated because I did. I definitely did. So definitely check it out. It's called, what's the interview title? It's called Kiko Kostandinov, um, Beyond the Imagination. I'll, I'll link it actually in the show notes so you can check out yourself and Fantastic Man. And I actually might go back out there and buy another magazine because I need to get back on there reading the odd magazines and stuff because why the hell not? Anyway, that has been the Excellent Zing Show episode number two, no, 616. Thanks again for tuning in. I really do appreciate your company. It's been great to have it as per usual. And I'm going to be playing my tune today at the end of the show. So if you hear that, you know it's the end. And if you're watching via the video, you'll hear no tune today. It'll just go to black. But thanks again for tuning in. And as per usual, make sure that you're smashing that like button down there below for me. If you enjoy the show, please thank you. See you again. Peace.